Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Drina Namas. Glad to be here tonight for the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society Book Club. Uh, we're in our third season. We began in the fall of 2020. Uh, that pandemic that we all lived through had closed down in in-person gatherings and initiating a book club was an idea whose time had come. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Gloria Ferris and Betsy O'Hagan for their efforts in getting this book club started. Um, I had just retired and I was really pleased to be able to look at a book club uh, about with the Audubon Society. Um, I'm retired, as I said, and I'm a nurse and um, I came to birding through my, my husband because he's such a nature loving guy and love birds. And we've been um, making birding part of our vacations um, since the last millennium. And uh, when we bought our first pair of binoculars at a Kmart outside Glacier National Park in about 1978. So um, tonight is our third night of our season for this year. Um, we do meet three times a year. Our themes, are quite broadly about nature and birds. And then more specifically, even though these are large topics, we talk about natural history, adaptation, climate change, conservation. Sometimes we've looked at a single bird like the cerulean warbler or the misunderstood vulture and the even more misunderstood pigeon. And we also have talked about a single pioneer like Rachel Carson in her book, Silent Spring. If you have not read the book for tonight, that's A-OK. -okay. I hope that you will enjoy the discussion and perhaps you will want to read the, the book, A World on the Wing. And it's akin to a travel book uh, and adventure. Additionally, it is quite readable. I have prepared some slides on a few chapters tonight and we'll learn a little bit about the author and about how he became captivated by migration and birds, especially the Northern Sawet Owl, which he's been re researching for a very long time. So, I'd like to take a little time for some introductions and you are muted right now, but it would be great if we had a chance to just introduce ourselves and perhaps you could say a word or so about maybe what is your uh, spark bird, a bird that perhaps gives you great delight or it got you interested in birding or, or something else about nature that you might want to share. If you care to pass, that's a okay. Um, and I'll start and just tell you that uh, I would say my spark bird had, uh, was the red-headed woodpecker. Um, I just could not believe it that there was such a beautiful bird and that got me going. Would anybody else like to share their favorite bird and introduce themselves? Yeah, please uh, unmute my, and please unmute and, and go ahead and chat a little bit. Uh, my name is Nancy Brundage and I live in Young Canfield, Ohio, almost to the edge of the state on the eastern side. I, I'm a member of the COAC group, so that's how oh. I know. That's uh -huh. why I get your newsletter. And I saw this tonight and I thought, I've got to sign on. My spark bird was the Bob White. Oh. Um, I was living in Georgia and they came into my yard. This was like 1970. And uh, they were in my yard and one day, it was the mother, the father, and three little ones. And they came down the hill by the side of my house and they got to the street. And the, I believe it was the male. He started turning his head from one way to the other and back and forth. And then all of a sudden he started across the street when nothing was coming and they all followed over into the woods. And I thought, this is amazing. I mean, I've always loved birds and I've always been into nature my whole life, but that really got me into wanting to be a birder. And so I've been a birder for over 50 years now. 
So that's my story. Thanks. I'll go next. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Brocious. I'm a board member with Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And um, my spark bird was the red winged blackbird. Uh, I think it was back in 2017, I went to a women's retreat at the Cuyahoga Valley National Park and uh, a bird walk was a scheduled activity. So um, my husband bought me a pair of binoculars so I could participate and the red winged blackbirds were there. The males are the ones that, that stood out and I just thought their behavior was so fascinating and their, um, their feathers were so glossy and I just thought they were beautiful. So that's what really got me into birding. Mm -hmm. Neat. My name is Marianne Warner, and I'm fairly new in the Audubon. Um, I raised my children that we went for bird walks. Mm -hmm. uh, we went with uh, Don Altimus. He became mm -hmm. a very good friend. And um, actually, he painted uh, for one of my sons. He has a painting of his in his home. Um, Don was a wonderful birder, and mm -hmm. uh, he just uh, made us appreciate uh, uh, nature a great deal. Uh, this book was excellent, absolutely excellent. I couldn't keep away from it. And I made little notes to myself for reference for the future. It's a travel log of, of all these places in the world that I have never, you know, did not know much about. Um, the uh, it's it's uh, so well written that uh, you know once you start with it I couldn't put it down. It uh, I learned a lot from this, and I'm very grateful. And I love the Audubon Club. It's uh, I've been in and out of the Audubon over the years, and I'm really in it for serious now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very thankful. Oh, thanks for sharing that. <laughs> You're most welcome. Hi, I'm Leslie and I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, and I can't call myself a birder yet. I'm, I'm sort of a tag along, learn what I can from all these amazing people in, uh, in our in Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Um, my spark birds are, are <clears throat> excuse me, starter spark birds were just who we could gather in our backyard. And then that sort of, you know, migrated, oh, stupid pun, um, into the, the metro parks. And I think it was hard to say on any given day, we're in love with a new one, but I think really, and I'm talking about my husband and I, we're really fascinated by the woodpeckers. Mm -hmm. the, the, the little ones <laughs> who can who flit around and make a lot of noise. So anyway, <laughs> that's my story. Love this group. Thank you for doing this. Anybody else would like to share their spark bird or uh, another part of birding? Well, maybe I could add something else. My son took me on a road scholar uh, oh. and we went and, oh, uh, by the Lake Erie and we ended up banding birds. And it's an excellent, excellent program. We learned so much with that. So something right around the corner here in Ohio. Wonderful. No. Oh. Anybody else? Okay, thanks for sharing. Well, a little bit about Scott Weidensaw. Um, firstly, he started out as a journalist and he wrote about natural history. He grew up in Pennsylvania and had his first job at a Pennsylvania newspaper. Over the years, he has become quite involved, much more than a journalist. And he is a researcher, um, co-director of Project Owlnet, which is about the Sawwets. Also, Project Snowstorm, about snowy owls, and he's there uh, posed with a, a snowy owl. 
and then Come he's co co-founder of the Critical Connections uh, Research Project, which is looking at, he talked about it in the book, about uh, doing research on birds in the national, in the Alaska National Parks. And the book starts off with him talking about his, their work in Denali. And he's also director of ornithological programs at the uh, Audubon's Hog Island in Maine. So he's got a lot going on. And um, I was able to see him in March when he was at the Black River Audubon Society uh, this past spring, March, and um, he he does say his first job is really being an author. That's how he is uh, thinks of himself. So in 1999, uh, he wrote a book about migration, and it was about only the Western Hemisphere. And um, so here it is. Uh, more than 20 years later, and he has another book, A World on the Wing, that has a, a much broader scope. And it also, because so much has happened with technology, uh, that it, it has a whole different story to it. And then also what has happened that we're all experiencing is the decline of birds and uh, what's happening with our climate. So his, his book does get into that too. So um, the title, the subtitle, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds, I thought was quite fitting because again, his, this is such a book about global issues. And I've listed here some of the places that he uh, takes us to on, on our travels. And uh, some of them, I was not familiar with. I had not heard of Nagaland before. I was completely unfamiliar with many of the islands of the Atlantic and Pacific that he talks about. Um, so there was so much to learn in terms of the globe. And then um, I, I really think the word Odyssey is, is quite special too, because uh, Odyssey means travels and adventures, a long series. And so here we are on Scott's Odyssey as he takes us around the world. But then he also shows us how each bird itself is on its own Odyssey and each bird is different. So it's, its Odyssey is different too. And the picture we show here is a um, great cheek thrush and it has a locator on it. And this is one of the birds that uh, he was tracking and in Denali in Alaska. The first chapter um, is called um, Spoonies and it's devoted to, a good part of it is devoted to this beautiful, cute little spoonie, a spoon-billed sandpiper. Um, it is, has been on the edge of extinction and there's been tremendous efforts uh, to try to help it, to restore it. And um, so this chapter goes into that story. And since about 2004 is when great efforts have gone into trying to save the bird. And it's involved uh, people in Russia, and China and in South Southeast Asia, it's become you know an international effort. Um, there is a, a active group, proactive group called the Spoonbill Task Force, and they update their information uh, twice yearly through their Spoonbill Task Force newsletter. And the latest issue um, is from November of of last year, and it. It talks about what progress has been made and new endeavors. And interestingly, uh, they talk uh, about the people who participate in the research. And one of the members of the research team uh, recently had had a baby and he and his wife uh, gave a middle name of Caledrus, the uh, genus name of the spoon-billed sandpiper. So that their, their baby's name 
middle name is Calidrus. Uh, that was kind of that was kind of fun. I have a resource here from the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. They put together a series of four videos on the spoonbill sandpiper to show various phases of their migratory life. So there's a video on uh, their breeding, on their courtship, on their wintering, and on their foraging, and also on hatching. And they're very well done. So if you get a chance to um, check those out, I think you, you might be delighted. Additionally, there was such an effort uh, among conservationists to bring to the forefront the uh, status of this bird and what's needed to help save it. So there was big educational effort and all kinds of publicity and uh, activities for children. And um, it seems to have helped. But here's their odyssey. Um, their wintering grounds are in far northeast Russia. And fortunately, part of that land has become protected because of the spoonies and because of the efforts of conservationists. It's kind of a, got some hope there. And then you can see the yellow uh, arrow is their migratory path. But there where China is, um, the letters for China are, that's very near the Yellow Sea. And that is one of their stops. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that area. And then they, um, they do their wintering in Southeast Asia, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. So quite extensive. And it's because of the technology of locators and it, it's become so advanced that now they've been able to track spoonbills and know where they go. Uh, and it's interesting to see exactly where they go and where they go during a day and, and over a period of weeks. So um, um, maybe Marianne too, you, you appreciate how much geography he introduces us to. Uh, uh, I found myself looking up uh, using my atlas quite a bit uh, because I'm not familiar with these areas, but the Yellow Sea is a very important uh, migratory stop. And uh, because of the Yellow River and the way it had flowed, it had delivered uh, tremendous amounts of silt over years and years and years. And, and there are extensive mud flats. Um, at the, uh, at the delta of the river. And these mud flats are, they're just huge. Um, and he talks about how uh, when the tide goes out, it's 20 kilometers or about 12 miles out. And so people do go out on the mud flats to do birding. There's a picture, some pictures in his book about it, but then the tide comes rushing back in very quickly. So they have to be quite careful. Um, so originally it was a huge area of, of 2.7 million acres and only a, about a third of that is left. But yet there are 8 million shorebirds who use this place to stop over to rest and refuel. So it, it's a critical area. Um, this is a picture to show the different flyways and the spoonbill is in the East Asian Australasian flyway, which is the red area. It's kind of a, a hourglass kind of figure, um, but it's extensive. It's so, so gigantic as are all these flyways and the birds are able to manage their migration over huge areas, tremendous areas and miles. They put human beings uh, physiology kind of to uh, shame in a way. Some good news though. And when Scott was writing this book, um, he wasn't quite sure if some things were going to actually take place, but an area of the Yellow Sea has become a UNESCO protected land. And uh, this was just a great uh, relief to a lot of people. Uh, the Chinese government did uh, recognize, seem to recognize the importance of these wetlands 
and they were able to slow down the, you know, just the exponential economic growth that is taking place in China. But unfortunately, they have lost uh, two thirds of their coastal land to re reclamation, meaning reclaiming it to use for other purposes. Well, the next chapter, Quantum Leap, um, does make quite a, a leap into uh, the world of physics. And uh, two, um, two scientists that Scott discusses in this chapter and also throughout the book. I think it's it's neat how he does that. He gives recognition to uh, lots of people that he works with and scientists. And he is uh, his bibliography contains a considerable um, uh, list of scientific works. But um, I have these pictures mixed up, actually. Um, Mr. Piersma should, is more with migration physiology, and Mr. Schulten is more with orientation and navigation. So I've just switched those around. Um, first about migration physiology, because I found this being a nurse, I found this to be just tremendously of interest. Um, looking at the red knot, and this is just one variety of the red knot, but Mr. Piersma uh, did lots of research on this bird. Um, the Icelandic red knot winters in Northwest Europe, uh, then it breeds in Greenland and the Eastern Canadian Arctic. And on its way, it stops in Iceland where it it goes through a binge and bulk phase. And this is what a lot of birds do. In Iceland for three and a half weeks, it just eats as, as much as it can. And but their hearts, their stomachs, and their livers start to increase just in that first week. And then in the next 10 days, they continue to be eating foods that can, are rich in fat. Their intestines, kidneys, and their legs muscles grow. Meanwhile, their stomachs are starting to shrink because they're about to go on their uh, flight and they don't really need their stomachs to be so big and heavy. So the stomachs begin to shrink, but the liver has doubled in size and um, our livers are, are you know, our metabolic factories. So uh, that liver will serve them well over the course of their trip. And then another um, amazement, uh, amazing physiological feat is this bar-headed goose. And it is able to fly over the Himalayas at that altitude. Um, and we learn a little bit about uh, its journey. Um, the map here shows the breeding areas are in orange and the wintering areas are in blue. And so the orange areas are up in Mongolia and also Western China and uh, far, far uh, Western Asia and some other parts of China. Um, and then it makes its journey uh, through Northeast part of India and also through Northern to Southern India and then also into Pakistan. But um, some of the amazing feats of this bird are that it can climb 3,000 feet an hour for about three hours to get to the height it needs. Um, lungs of birds in general are quite efficient. They have air sacs as well as lungs that allows them to pull in tremendous amounts of air and oxygen. And it's quite efficient, uh, particularly this goose, its lungs are larger. Um, they have a better hemoglobin than we do. Um, it carries oxygen in the blood better. Uh, they're able to resist pulmonary edema, which is a problem for human beings in high altitudes. Um, also, their heart is proportionally larger. In general, they can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide much more efficiently, and they can tolerate lower levels of oxygen. Um, while they're flying. Now, for human beings, when our oxygen levels are low, we often have a change in our, our mental status. 
but uh, for these birds, they're able to uh, carry on their journey. So Klaus Schulten is uh, more involved with uh, more physiology, less physiology and more about navigation. And this has been such a mystery. How do birds navigate? I found this chapter a little bit difficult in terms of understanding the physics of it. And um, I thought I would just read a little bit of it um, to help to explain it better than I think I could. So um, I'm on page 86. Um, Schulten had indeed found the grail of magnetoreception. It's a pretty weird grail, but then so are most things in the quantum realm. Here is the framework as it's currently understood. A migrating bird flapping through the night sky glances up at the stars. A photon Having left one of those stars millions or even billions of years earlier, enters the bird's eye and strikes a molecule of a form of cryptochrome, almost certainly a specific variant known as cryptochrome 1A or cry 1A. This encounter takes place in the retina, probably within a set of specialized vision cells known as double cones, whose function had heretofore been a mystery. The photon knocks free one of Cry-1A's electrons, kicking that electron into a neighboring Cry-1A. Because they now each have an odd number of electrons, the two molecules are known as a radical pair and are linked or entangled in the jargon of quantum mechanics. But they are also magnetic because the electrons have a property known as spin, such entangled particles are joined regardless of distance, defying classical physics and common sense. They have become in effect one thing. If you measure the properties of one, even when they're separated by millions of light years, you could infer the properties of the other. There's an, just one more paragraph. Einstein, whose own work helped spawn the concept, famously rebelled against this idea of entanglement, which he dismissed in the 1930s as, quote, spooky action at a distance, unquote. Yet experiments have borne it out. In the eye of a migrating bird, the effect of countless radical pairs probably creates a dim shape of smudge visible as the bird moves ahead, but not opaque enough to interfere with normal vision that shifts the bird's position relative to the ground and the inclination of magnetic field lines arcing out of the planet. So I, I find these concepts difficult, um, but it seems as though it's a, an explanation that is understood by others. So it seems that birds are able to detect magnetic fields partly by the incline of the angle of magnetic field lines. There is a, a particular molecule that seems to be key in doing this biochemical comp, uh, compass. Um, yet there's another ability of birds and that's their sense of maps. Um, and that is not yet understood. Scott um, Weidenzahl was going to meet with um, Mr. Schulten and to do some work together. And uh, unfortunately, Mr. Shulton died before they were able to get together. Uh, chapter three is a little bit on the scientific side too, and that it's uh, kind of about scientific uh, philosophy. And the chapter is called, We Used to Think. And Scott Weidenstahl's mother, uh, kind of teased him a little bit about this because the saying was going, we used to think, but now we know. And she said, huh? We used to think, and do you really know? And that's kind of the nature of science is that uh, we find out more and more and more. So, but about this chapter, he talks uh, more about the technology 
and talks about a particular uh, system that he's been involved with and he's been putting up these antenna himself. And it's uh, the MODIS system. And you can see one of the um, antenna there. And then on the right side of the picture are, are some different locators. And these are what are affixed to birds. And now they are so lightweight, some of them weigh less than a gram. So they can be placed on almost any bird, including hummingbirds, and they are put on hummingbirds. They also can be put on dragonflies and monarch butterflies. So it's uh, the technology has just remarkably changed from things that they used to only be able to put on birds that were probably bigger than shorebirds. So uh, this has now opened up a whole new world to be able to track um, songbirds and so forth and, and tiny birds. Well, while I was um, reading about MODIS and I looked up a little bit, I was uh, found an issue of the Audubon magazine from um, last fall, fall of 22, and it had a, an article about MODIS. So that was wonderful to find. And then uh, I found another article. I had not looked at it last fall, but it talks about Audubon's bird uh, migration explorer, a feature uh, for uh, on the internet. And I thought I would just sh show you, um, here's a screenshot of a little bit, show you a little bit about how it uh, works. And um, uh, you can choose your location. Um, so I chose Cleveland, Ohio. And when I did that, it, it pulled up this map and you can see um, they're kind of lavender to purplish uh, shapes. And each represents um, a place where a bird was tr actually tracked. And the darker the color means the more tracked birds were accounted for. And the darkest color goes is about 10 birds or more. And, uh, but it does get down to one bird, which is kind of neat. So when you choose your location, uh, you choose your location and then you can choose another spot anywhere you'd like to. And I happened to go to Venezuela here and pick a place and it showed that there was a Connecticut warbler, a bank swallow and a bobolink that had been in Cleveland, and now they were in this part of Venezuela. So it's really, uh, it just, to me, it is so cool. And this is, you know, another indication that migration science is uh, able to, um, you know, expand itself and be, to become much more accurate. Uh, the chapter um, Enanum was my favorite chapter. Uh, and it is about Nagaland, uh, which is a, a part of India, even though this area does not want to be part of India. It considers itself more like part of Tibet. So they have a, a, a different feeling about India. Um, also, they're very Christian. It's a Baptist country. And they used to be, their culture was really of headhunters. So it's an interesting place and quite remote. So um, I have a map here to show you where Nagaland is. If you're not familiar with it, I was not. Um, you can see too with a, a, this slide of kind of the remoteness and the forest sta station of parts of Nagaland. Well, the story that about this chapter has a kind of a beginning um, for what happened with the Amer falcon, which is um, a bird that migrates and it stops over in Nagaland before it goes all the way to South Africa. And uh, the picture on the left is a picture of a reservoir that was built in the early 2000s. And fortunately, you know, it provided electricity for this remote area, which was a, a wonderful thing. On the other hand, it, it flooded their fields and their farmlands. And so many of the people were, had to move their farmlands and to move up the hills. Uh, and the land was less desirable for farming. Additionally, they had the problem of elephants coming through. So, 
for some strange and unexplained reason, it still hasn't been understood, these Amer Falcons would, as they came through and stopped over, they roosted all together around the reservoir. And there were hundreds of thousands of them. And they stayed for a while, like more than three weeks. And so the people thought, oh, well, this is uh, a godsend, really, um, because it would provide not only food for them, but also something that they could sell. So they did capture these uh, Amer falcons by the thousands and smoked them and sold them. And they also captured them so that they would have them for uh, being able to smoke further down the calendar. Now on the right, we have a picture of a male and a female, the males on the uh, right and the females on the left. And the word Inanu means love to. And that's what the people of Nagaland call uh, the Amer Falcons, the Inanums, um, to represent how they have seen them always, they see them together as, as pairs. Um, their migration is um, from, from the coast of China. And they do have a stopover in Naga land and then continue. And this bird has the longest uh, migratory path of any other uh, prey, bird of prey. Um, just to go over the Indian Ocean is 2,400 miles. Now, the Amer uh, falcons, when they get to Naga land, the timing is really good because they're, they're in time for this uh, out, outbreak of termites. And so uh, there's a huge number of termites in there. The Amer falcons are able to feed on those. And uh, here's a picture of an Amer falcon in flight. And then um, part of the story then has to do with that the people, uh, were really slaughtering so many of uh, these falcons. Banu Naralu, the woman featured here, um, had heard about this. Uh, she's from this area of Nagalam, this uh, town called Ponti, and she had heard about the falcons, and so she came back uh, to investigate. She's a journalist. But when she came back and saw it, she was uh, somewhat appalled because Within a 10-day period, 140,000 falcons had been killed. And uh, she was uh, stunned and shocked and uh, come from a family of conservationists. And so it was an alarm to her. And she was able to uh, gather resources and start a campaign. And it's a rather a remarkable story because in a really short period of time, and Scott Widensall says it's probably one to two years, she and others were able to turn the attitude of people toward being very respectful and considerate and also looking upon the falcon as something very important to their ecology. And part of the persuasion was that they did track, they put locators on falcons, and so they kept people informed of where the falcons were going. And so it was kind of a neat story for uh, kind of educational as well as excitement about, oh, where did these birds go? So Ponti, the city town has been called the, the falcon capital of the world, and uh, it's brought a lot of pride. Um, Mr. Weidenstahl does talk about how uh, there's been this effort to talk about, can they make this a tourist attraction? It's very hard to get to uh, the, these areas, very hard. It was dangerous uh, travel, the roads are terrible. It's quite remote. The bureaucracy is um, difficult. Uh, so it's there's a lot of work to be done to get tourists to the area, but some people have embraced tourism. 
However, it's not for everybody. Um, not everybody can be in tourism. And so will uh, this be sustainable? Hopefully, but um, there's such a uh, surprise, I think, that they were able to turn around people's attitudes about a bird in such a short period of time. So this is, you know, kind of a really uh, hopeful story. Also, it was quite suspenseful, uh, <laughs> this chapter. So this doesn't quite capture, I'm sure, I, you know, I'd love to be there to be able to see tens of thousands of falcons. So um, it's referred to as a wildlife spectacle. And fortunately, you know, the, the falcons are there for not just a three or four days, but for weeks. So if people are able to come, there's a period of time that they'd be able to see it. So I would like to, I was able to find some fabulous, fabulous videos. And going back to this, this is from a David Attenborough um, video on the Amer Falcon migration. And you can find it easily on YouTube um, if you put in David Attenborough and Amer Falcons and BBC or something like that. And it's, it, it's beautiful. It's wonderful to watch. And you can see it as a spectacle. Um, some other resources, um, Scott Weidensahl, in his in the uh, Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology's uh, their magazine Living Bird the summer of uh, 2018 he has a story about the Amer Falcon um, and uh, this is the link here for it through that uh, magazine article now David Lindo who has been here with us and we had an interview with him in our book club in 2020. Um, but he has an interview with Scott Weisendahl on Weidensall, excuse me, uh, uh, talking about this book too. It's a wonderful interview. So if you are looking to uh, hear a little bit more, um, it's a great interview. And you can find it at uh, the urbanbirderworld.com. And then he has a section called In Conversation. Um, he has educational videos. Um, it was pretty easy to find. I think if you put um, Urban Bird or World or Scott Widensall, it, it may pull it up for you. And then um, Scott Widensall has a, a, a website that's just full of all kinds of information, especially about his projects. Um, the um, Sawed Owl, the Snowy Owl, the Alaska Project. So. So tonight, um, as Mary Ann said too, there's so much in this book. And I basically, I just looked at uh, a few chapters and there's so much more to go over. Also just wanted to say a little bit about the uh, World Migratory Bird Day and the Environment of the Americas, which sponsors this. And um, Migratory days this year are May 13th and October 14th. The theme this year for the um, Environment of Americas is looking at water and birds and how important that is for migration. Um, Environment of the Americas has a really good book club and um, they meet usually the last Thursday of the month. They feature an author, the author's there and a book. It's very good. Well, next year, we're looking at uh, October 17th. Um, January 16th and April 23rd next year is our dates for our book club. And uh, we're working on the selections um, for what we'll be reading. And um, this book was my favorite this year, although uh, Hurricane Lizards was awfully pretty good too. So, so that's it. Wow, thanks so much, Drina. Um, maybe if you would uh, stop sharing and when we can see everybody that will okay. that's here Thank you. in the group okay. and ask, uh, get some more questions. I There is a question that was in the chat and they asked about the Amur Falcon. Um, you were mentioning the, they were caught and sold and smoked. Now, is this smoking for preserving them for food? Yes. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I think what... I remember that that um, David Attenborough show on TV because I'm like, wow, I think I remember something about that. I did not even get to that part of the of the book yet because there's just mm -hmm. so much to read. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of, maybe a lot of you have not finished uh, the entire book. Yeah. So, but I'm like, that really sounds familiar with all these falcons and people catching them and, and you know, preserving. I'm like, where did I hear that? And mm -hmm. I think that's where it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the um, people interviewed in, in that chapter, uh, an, an older man who was persuaded to stop, um, you know, killing the birds and smoking them. But he he did say they taste really, really, really good. <laughs> oh, again, any questions? Um, I, I found the the chapter that Drina was talking about the physiology and the migration, absolutely mind blowing. And I think in the same way, I'm thinking, wow, these birds can do all this. They can shrink organs, they can store fat, they can burn up energy, they have better. If we could use some of that technology in our medicine, you know, for the future, you know, how that might help somebody with a, a liver disease or, or you know, pulmonary disease or something like Yes. You know, sometimes, sometimes people say, oh, why are you studying that? That's really not, and it could be important. Maybe, maybe not now, but maybe for the future. Mm -hmm. We used to think, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I really appreciated how he uh, is so collegial. And uh, the book is also a story about the history of birding and the history of, of those who are researching. And he's established so many relationships over the years that are important to him. As, so that's part of his odyssey too. Again, there's, we're, we're open for questions or just Hello. to chat about maybe a, a chapter. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm Erin. Hi, Erin. I'm way up. I'm up here in Toronto. <laughs> and I want to tell you how fascinating this is. Super. Great. Great. Um, we don't have an Audubon in Canada. Oh, uh-huh. So anyways, this is, you know, it's wonderful to be part of you mm -hmm. down there. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Erin, for joining in. Yes. You're most welcome. Thank you. Erin, do you ever do you ever get down here? Do you ever get down to Ohio or around here? You know what, uh, Leslie, with the with the uh the Canadian dollar not doing so well, not really although it's much cheaper to fly into the States than it is even for me to fly home, only one province over. But mm -hmm. no, really? Not, really, not these days. We will have to take a field trip to Toronto. <laughs> All of us can come the, see you. The American Birding Association is having a birding weekend here the last weekend in Toronto, in April. Oh, it's all oh wow. Mi, mi casa su casa. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all part of the Americas, right? And so, it, was, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know who, I, I will admit, I have not read the book. Um, I'm wondering who did read it and what your thoughts are. Um, it sounds like a kind of technical book, is it? You know, a little maybe over my head. I, I'm an editor, by the way, by trade, but that doesn't mean I, I'm a good leisure reader. I'm not. You know, I kind of need to. I don't know. You Lots. know, or semicolon goes. <laughs> that, that is that's about it. <laughs> exactly. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> 
but you did really well explaining the physics, I think, because I don't know, you know, I couldn't even pass out grade 10 physics. Right. Well That's done. why I read it. Well, you know, once you start to read it and and you find out how they um, can fly uh, and, and be able to just partially sleep, um, how their different organs work um, and what they can accomplish. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. And you, he takes you to so many countries. I mean, you travel in the world with him. This is, once you start the book, you're going to fall in love with it. You won't be able to get away from it. <laughs> what great. do elephants have to do with anything? I'm sorry, Maria. You mentioned something about the elephant. In the area in, in Naga, Nagaland, yeah, I think it was it, like it well, used to be. A, yeah, yeah, that's elephants are elephants. elephants are in that area, and so that's just one more stress on the people who are trying to farm is oh. to deal with uh, elephants. Hmm. And I, you know, up here on CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company Corporation. There was a wonderful, wonderful four or five part David Attenborough uh, series. It was wonderful. And they, anyways, it jogged my mind because it just ended last week and they did a whole thing about elephants. Mm -hmm. They talk about as the seasons change in the Northern hemisphere as well as the Southern. Well worth it if you can find it. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm going to mention to Leslie, Leslie, the, the whole book is not that technical. There are chapters that are a lot more technical, yeah. but I just finished the chapter that talked about long distance migrants and short distance migrants and how the global warming, the, the plants are, are coming out earlier and the birds that are coming from further away, places like Central or South America, it's not meshing, the, the food sources aren't meshing with the birds that are arriving because the, the plants are out much earlier. So, I mean, it's just simple things like that. And you're like, oh, I never thought of that. Or, yeah. or, or, where, the, or where they head in the non-breeding season. So, you know, droughts and, and, and all kinds of other things. It's, it, it's, it's really, really interesting. It just, it makes you think. It, and, yes. If you want to think, uh, try. Don't don't read it before you go to bed, though. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be like, "Wow!" You'll be just you won't be able to sleep. I do it go to was bed. About, it was oh, I don't know what it was. It was like thirty degrees Celsius here, and now it's snowing. So as you said, the the vegetation does not know what to do. Right, and nope. it mucks up everybody. Everything. It does. It does. I have a hard enough time sleeping because of climate change and things like that. <laughs> I really just looking at my front yard, and, you know, who's who's who we're helping to live, and I hope we're helping and not throwing them off base. And but this sounds great, and I didn't mean to. I didn't mean that as a derogatory thing, no, Dwayna. Sure. Thank you for sure. really disseminating that chunk it did make me think oh i don't know <laughs> <laughs> no. but uh I, yeah i definitely want to read this i still need to read the pigeon book by the way so <laughs> i'm a little behind hmm. this is wonderful yeah it really was. thank you i i so enjoyed this book wow i did too wonderful wonderful yeah May, now, may I found ask it. a question? Does anybody down there uh, use binoculars to bird? Yeah, I think, I think and pretty much so, we all do when we're out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I wanted to, you know, have a buy, purchase a starter pair, anybody have any suggestions? I started with a Nikon Monarchs, and I thought it was a really good. I you can get them on. Well, I don't know. You're you're in Canada. Amazon. I bought mine on Amazon um, for about hundred bucks. Hundred. Not too bad. Mm -hmm. And they're called Monarchs. Nikon Monarchs. Yeah, okay. like you. the butterfly. Okay. 
Yeah, you, you will, will have to maybe look at price range. I mean, you mm -hmm. could get anything from a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand know, dollars. Um, okay. So yeah, looking online, um, sometimes if you have a store, a bird seed store, bird feed store, or you know, I, even, even stores that sell hunting equipment, sometimes they have binoculars that you can test out, see if they're comfortable in your hands, you know, comfortable up to your eyes, that kind of stuff. Because sometimes you. they're heavy, light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you said the American Birding Association is coming to Toronto. They They're might awful. have they the might have people there. Mm -hmm. They might and have like people to... there you could ask or they might even have people there who are trying to sell binoculars so you could try them out. Yeah, I'd like to come okay. equipped and I'll, uh, and I don't know it's called the feeder wherever they are meeting is outside the city. Mm. And uh, anyway, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult to travel outside the city so hopefully I'll be able to carpool with somebody mm -hmm. who lands here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Autobahn have sort of starter I feel like one of my first pairs was a, an Audubon pair and it, you know, it was really affordable just to make sure you really enjoy it and you you know, I can't remember yes. though. I don't know. I don't want to I, make a huge investment without. Yeah. It started pretty cheap. And then of course you get a little more addicted every time you go. <laughs> and, and then, and then. When you start going on bird walks, you look at so you look through somebody else's pair, <laughs> and you go, "Oh my, it's a whole other world." So, do you, you know, do you uh, do you, do you know about David Suzuki down there? Probably not. David oh. Suzuki is uh, he's up in Canada. He's a wonderful, wonderful environmentalist, and he has he has the show that he has hosted for 41 years called The Nature of Things. I'm sure you can find it online. Wow. wow. This season just ended. He's 81. He's retired. He did a whole wonderful, wonderful hour on uh, woodpeckers. Oh, wow. Oh, my oh. goodness. Wow. Wow. I think is that on YouTube or CDC? The CDC? Uh, is you, you, it's probably CBC. But there's an app called CBC Gem, J G E M, and it's free. Okay. And it's like it's it's wonderful. They have more than you can ever want of anything, and you will find it there for sure. I don't think it would be on YouTube. Okay. And it was well, well worth poking around into the nature of things. It sounds, sounds good. familiar, but and he's got the David Suzuki Foundation. And anyways, he's a he's huge up here. Huge. I'm looking well thanks everybody. Um yes. glad you could make it. Yeah. Thank you, Greena. You're welcome. Thank you so much, everyone. Aaron, it was great meeting you. Yes. And great to meet you too. <laughs> yep. Fantastic. The wonders of, every, of the World Wide Web. Yep. Everybody have a great spring. Uh, it will stop snowing eventually. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, good birding, good enjoying the environment and the outdoors. Thanks yes. again, Drina. Okay. Thank you, Drina. You're welcome. Thank you.